I mean, for the people that are online, right? Yeah. Oh, do, do you have a little one? Good morning. Everybody remember to uh, log into the data tracker because that's how the blue sheets are, uh, are done. Uh, I think you know, everybody knows uh, Chris and myself. This is the LSR working group, the first uh, session of IETF 118 in Prague, Czech Republic. And uh, next slide. Go ahead. So, since this is the first meeting, you should really refresh your memory for what's on the note well uh, regarding both disclosure of any IPR and uh, decorum during the IETF. Next slide. We have a few RFCs. We had the uh, Update to OSPF terminology, I was on that one. That was just uh, updating all the uh, uh, objectional language, the master-slave terminology and all the OSPF drafts and a couple places where, and I don't understand this one, where we eliminated black hole as a uh, sink for traffic that gets dropped and used a term of unreachable. We have these two, these two uh, biz documents that we did. That was kind of an experiment to see how fast we could do them. We got them done in about two years, which is probably record time. Next slide. Have a couple on the RFC queue. The OSBF V3 extensions for SRV6 is important because there's some IDR drafts there's at least one IDR BGPLS draft that's dependent on that one. Next slide. We have a few uh, a few drafts waiting AD review. Uh, some of these actually, I would say the most important one, and I moved it up to the top, is the Yang model for it, OSPF extended LSAs. The reason I moved up to the top is because a lot of the other Yang models are dependent on this one since they augmented. The others, the ISIS flash flooding is a real good piece of work. We had a lot of collaboration, a lot, a lot of different groups within the IETF. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's uh, important too. And then the last two are, they're important, but they're not as important. They're both uh, experimental drafts. Some real good work that when the working group was <coughs> working on it, we spent a lot of time, but they kind of, you know, towards the end, they kind of fell out. Nobody, I guess, think, I think we have one implementation of the dynamic flooding. Next slide. And we think these are ready for a working draft for work last call. Be good to get these ones is these are the last remaining documents from before the working group merger of ISIS and OSPF. Next slide. And we have a lot of people who have asked uh, for, these are, pro we're gonna try and get some of these done. There's, there's another page of these. Wait, go back, did I? Here, okay, next slide again. I see less is in the queue. I don't know, do you wanna take it now or? Yeah, I guess so. I can't be worried. Because... Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask, by the way, I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah. Excellent. Like you're okay. here. <laughs> um, so on the the last uh, bullet there, the you know the multipology routing for VTN. Uh, given the direction that the T's working group is going, do we really want to move ahead with this document at this time? It's an informational draft, and it is one way you could do it if you didn't require a lot of scalability. I just because the offers asked for adoption, I just read it in the last uh, last two weeks. I don't know. We'll we'll let the working group decide when we when we call it. Okay. Okay. Next slide. Uh, we got these Yang documents. 
I think the last, the SRV6 ones are more important. I think there's, and, the, and the, that's the one I said was dependent on the, the last one's the one that was dependent on um, extended LSAs, Yang document. Next slide. And we have another number of existing documents. The first one is, is a spin on flex algorithm. And we're gonna see another one in this, another spin on, you know, just an augmentation of uh, 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 the flex algorithm draft. That one probably is, you could put it almost in protocol maintenance. These others are all experimental drafts. Next slide and last slide. Okay, and we had one new working group uh, document that's gonna be presented today. I'm sorry for taking more long than I, more time than I intended to. You did fine. I did fine. I made it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. great! I thought I was. I thought I was going over. I know we got a full agenda today. So if you undo that, here, we'll click that. No, no, the other, the green one. Okay, oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to have to click the green one. Remember, um, you got it now, okay? Yeah. I, the, the only thing I was going to mention is that our agenda is really full. Um, at the last minute, there was a, a, a something added to the end, um, and it should have said uh, discussion allotment time, the last 10 minutes. Uh, the extra presentation is only if we don't utilize that 10 minutes in discussion. I'd like to do that going forward because we've had sessions before where we just cut everybody off. It's just presentation only, and I think that's pretty useless. Yeah. I, so status is this? This is it, right? Yeah. Okay, Peter, you're you're up. I think we got the uh, new media echo UI down now. Yeah, I watched the thing. But... I attended one of the sessions, but I didn't Ooh. have chair control. Wow. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Good morning. I'm Peter Pschenak. Uh I'm going to give a quick update on the unreachable prefix advertisement in IGPs. On behalf of all the callers listed, next slide, please. So this has been presented numerous times, and as, as uh, AC already said, this was adopted after the last uh, ITF meeting. Next slide, please. So there is no significant change here. Uh, what we change is the way that we advertise the new flags that have been defined for advertising the unreachability. So in the previous version of the draft, we used different mechanism for SPFV2 and different mechanism for SPFV3. For V3, we even added a new TLV, but then we looked and uh, there was an existing draft which defines a sub TLV for advertising additional flags for both V2 and V3. So we decided to use that instead of, you know, using different mechanisms in the, in, in the different versions of the protocol. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> what we did, we took that existing uh, sub TLV which has been defined you know, SPFV2, it is part of the, uh, it's a sub-TLV of the extended prefix TLV. In V3, it's uh, a sub-TLV of all, all the OSPFV3 uh, prefix TLVs, all the types. And the draft will be presented later today, so you can wait and see what it is. It's really just the TLV with a, with a new flags being defined. Next slide, please. 
We also added some editorial comments made mainly from <clears throat> Bruno, where we clarified what the new bits are used for, that they are used to signal unreachability and they are really useful if there are any other reasons why someone may want to advertise the prefix with unreachable metric because we still use that metric. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And that's it. So any comments? Hi, Jun, you're in the queue. Yeah, I Jun from Thai Telecom. First, I want to express it again. It, it is hard to hurry to adopt this document. There are many. Uh, we're, we're not going to cover the adoption at yeah, all I know. because I, you I, can appeal to the ISG on that. Okay. You've already talked to. to I just AD. want to point out the uh, technical issue if exists and uh, not answered. Uh, the first is, you know, there are there is already the uh, existing TLV that can um, label the unreachable information. Why why we use another newly undefined and un exist? Uh, I, I believe I believe you're referring to the overloading of the prefix origin yeah. that, that you that you that you proposed at one time. Yeah, that's overloading. It doesn't hire. It, it doesn't handle the two use cases that uh, the the people came up with. I mean, I I don't know why you're trying to bring this up now. No, yeah, yeah. This is the second. Uh, this is I will answer. Ask the second. Uh, I mean, you know, you currently you define two flags, U flag and UP flag, but the UP flag is not necessary because if we uh, know the unreachable will be uh, is planned, the operator can also plan the or schedule the uh, switch over of the service. So we need not uh, extend the IDP protocol to carry such information. So uh, if we, it is the UP flag, I think the Prefix originator can uh, transfer the uh, unreachable information. So this is the second issue. Uh, the uh, the third is that you know in your in your proposal you uh, enforce the uh, usage of the <coughs> LS infinity. But currently in the operating network the LS infinity, LS infinity is used seldom. So and we. Um, I think you also know uh, there are other proposals want to use the LS Infinity. So we want to make the network more simple. And so uh, our proposal is want to fade out of the usage of the LS, not enhance it. So uh, we recommend to end the <coughs> uh, capability negotiation. So if the, because the operator can control the uh, upgrade of the node within one area. So, so uh, if the all if the node in the area all support the such capability, we need not the LS infinity. So I, uh, there may be other issues that I have raised in the mail list. For example, the um, network participation, you 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 don't uh, don't uh, discuss it. So but uh, we must uh, um, uh, solu uh, must solve such scenarios. So we cannot uh, ignore it. So there are many. Many issues have not be solved, so it is too hard to adopt this document. Why don't you take this to the list, then, if you have? Because I think we've been through all these things, and and the and the, and the things you're mentioning mm. are the technical uh, the reason the technical simplicity and the reason that this draft is adopted for this particular use case. So you can just take it to the list. Okay, so I think the, there are many technical issues have never be discussed uh, fully. So. Uh, I think we can compare the two proposal and uh, select the best ones. Okay. That was done. Do you understand that? The working group chose a different document and a different solution. No, no, no. no. You're not happy with that outcome, no. but like just rehashing this over and over and over again until you get the answer you want is not the solution here. No, because the issue has not been solved. So yeah, yeah. I think you can answer my question on the list clearly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, John, I thought you, I gave you the spot. I, I was really just getting up to to back up what you said, which is that um, our our time in this room is um, you know it's valuable. It's important that we have a chance to discuss technical issues. Um, it would be ideal if there were new issues. And I mean, I don't want to like steal your thunder you guys are are sharing it just fine but if we can keep 
questions, you know, focused to the point and raising, you know, new things. And also, um, I guess I'm breaking my rule myself now, but instead of making speeches at the mic, um, if we can actually engage with the person who's presenting, that would be preferable and appreciated. Thank you. Thanks. I think I can summary my technical issue and the list. So uh, I think the working group should resolve this issue. Okay, sure. All right. Thanks, Peter. I think is Ran in the room? Or is she remote? Or him? Is this the next one? I thought, isn't it just standard preprint? Ying Zhen, do are the are the slides ordered according to the thing? I, I don't have. Oh no, multi-part TLB, I guess. Is not okay, multi-part. All right. Yeah, yeah. That's why I was just going on those, so I, I need to pull up my agenda. So less less is remote. There it is. We know we can hear them already, though. Yep. Multi parts will be also OC. Okay. All right. Last. Okay. So you're going to control the slides, I take it? Oh, I should have given you the control. Yeah, let's just uh, do that. Let's run with that. I'm not sure where the control is, to, to be honest with I you. Didn't, I screwed up. Like, just in the interest of. I know I can. I just don't want to waste the work and just time. Okay. I, I, I'm not seeing the slide controls on my screen. So if you want to run it, that'll be fine. Mm -hmm. I'm clicking control click. Yeah, let's just all run them less. That's so fine. We can move, we can move forward. Okay, go ahead. All right. Uh, Okay, this is an update on multi-part TLV. Uh, these are the set of authors. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just a, a quick overview of uh, what the draft is trying to address. Uh, this slide has been presented before. Um, the, the fundamental issue is there's a limitation uh, because of the 8-bit length of advertising 255 octets uh, under a code point. Um, a number of new technologies have increased the, the demand for advertising more than 255 octets of information about various objects, particularly links and prefixes. Um, there are existing RFCs for some code points that have explicitly indicated that the way to address this issue is to send uh, multiple TLVs when necessary. And the draft is simply formalizing the extension of the use of what we call multi-part TLVs uh, to all code points where it's necessary to do so. Uh, there are implementations. Um, and I think the, the big issue that we've been discussing has to do with partial deployment. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So just updates in V4 of the draft, we put in some clarification that multi-part can apply to any code point which supports sub-TLVs. Uh, that includes both top-level TLVs and sub-TLVs that themselves have a, a, a nested level of sub-TLVs. Um, we added back a capability advertisement uh, that indicates that an implementation has uh, support for multi-part TLVs where the original RFC did not have an explicit specification of that. We'll discuss this a little more shortly. And we've introduced a companion draft uh, to advertise uh, what, at least in ISO speak, has been called protocol implementation conformance statements uh, to advertise what a particular implementation supports. <coughs> uh, next slide, please. So the router capability sub-TLV, uh, there's the text that we put into the document. Um, there are some important caveats about this. 
this is informational only. It does not have any impact on the operation of the protocol. It's not used to determine what is advertised or what is processed. Uh, the granularity of the advertisement is not per code point. It's just saying, hey, I support multi-part TLV for TLVs uh, where the, the support uh, is needed, but it wasn't explicitly uh, indicated by the original RFC. This is an unusual use of a router capability advertisement. Router capability is really meant to advertise uh, things that the routing protocol itself makes use of in its operation. Uh, this is really informational only for the benefit of operators. And we put this in uh, to ease some concerns uh, that uh, when you have partial deployment and people send uh, multiple TLVs for uh, a given object, uh, and not all the implementations support it. Uh, there, there are concerns about how disruptive this could be. So we put this in, but again, it's, it's informational only, and we definitely do not want this to be used as a model for uh, the introduction of new capabilities. Next slide, please. So, there's also a companion draft that uh, Ying's. Sorry, my comment will be better right now if that's all right. Uh, I don't know what you're saying. Oh, I'm on the queue. Okay, AC Lindum, uh, Lab N. Uh, I was just going to say, as the offer of RFC seven thousand seven hundred and seventy, OSPF does have and always has have both informational and functional capabilities, different variable bits streams for both of them. So we have always had the informational capabilities in the router capabilities advertisement. I just wanted to make right. that point. And now we're gonna have a decision for ISI as whether this is a good or bad idea. So I really think that's a good that's a good segue into your next uh, <laughs> your, yeah. your next presentation. Uh, but AC, I really think that your comment would be more appropriate after Yingzen's presentation. So hold that thought. Um, so we've introduced a, a companion draft. Um, it's one of the concerns that's been raised is how does the operator know what is supported by the, the various routers in their network? Uh, and uh, how do they, so therefore, how do they know whether it's safe to enable a particular feature or not? Um, and Yingzen's presentation um, should go through what we've uh, defined as, as a model for doing this. But I think there's two key points I want to em uh, emphasize here. That uh, the amount of information that you need to send to fully describe what a an implementation supports is far more than just a Boolean that says, I support this feature or I don't, don't support this feature. And that'll become clear, I think, in Yingzen's presentation. So this easily explodes into a large amount of data if you want to fully describe what an implementation supports. And sending this via the routing protocol is a very inappropriate choice because it means not only are you consuming a lot of space in, in the protocol advertisements, but you're storing this on every node when the information is really only of use from a network management point of view. So what we've chosen to do is to utilize Yang, since this is really management information and uh, further details uh, uh, will be shown in Yingzit's presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So at this point, we think the draft is uh, ready to be adopted. Uh, the need for it uh, exists today. There are already existing interoperable implementations that have been deployed. The draft is already just about two years old. The deployment needs that, that uh, drove the creation of the draft have existed for even longer than that. There's been a lot of discussion uh, on and off the list about can we not do this in a backwards compatible way? Uh, the answer to that is no. 
Uh, there is no way to do this in a backwards compatible way. Uh, there's been some suggestion, isn't this similar to when we went from narrow metrics to wide metrics? Uh, it is not similar. Um, we're not introducing any new code points. We don't have a legacy way to advertise more than 255 bytes. In, in the narrow wide case, we had a legacy way to advertise metric. Um, so th there was a transition path there. This is not available here. Uh, we think with the changes in the draft and the introduction of the new uh, Pixiang uh, draft that we've addressed the concerns about interoperability and deployment. And we'd really like to see this get adopted. So with that, I think uh, I'd like to see Yingxin complete her res uh, presentation and then take questions after that. Um, Wemo, I'm going to cut in front of you since I think you're going to say the same thing you've said on the list. I haven't said anything on the list yet. I do not agree with you, Les, when you say backwards compatible, but I believe the problem is that we have different definitions of backward compatible. But my definition of backward compatible means you're not creating routing loops because some routers don't understand the information that's being, where they interpret it incorrectly. So, you know, to be fair with that definition, Wemo solution is backward compatible because it doesn't create routing loops. Now, I think your point in your definition says that the same routing that existed before will exist after with no changes in the network. That's a much more narrow definition of backward compatible. I, I don't even think that that's valid. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, it's, I think we've done plenty of things in the past where all we cared about was that we could deploy the feature without breaking the network. Not that we've deployed the feature and everybody like worked with, you know, the, yeah. That, the, anyway, I think that's the problem and, and the miscommunication or at least the disagreement between you and Wemo. So, 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 Chris, it, uh, it's not that I disagree with you. I, I just think we're we're completely on different pages here. Okay, the point is there is no way uh, to, you know, to to deploy this uh, with partial deployment and have the network work. I'm not yeah, talking so here just, about what, repeating what uh, I just said, right? No, you, you I'm did... not. No, okay. I'm not repeating what you just said. Okay? okay, I'm not specifically concerned about routing loops. I'm uh, specifically concerned about the features that are using the advertisements working, whatever that means. And when you okay, have, but, but the, when you, when second. you, let me let me ask you to qualify. I said that your definition is that you deploy it in the in the same network operation exists. Is that not what you're saying? I'm saying that when you have features and the, all of the routers in the network support those features, but all of the routers in the network are not able to access the advertisements that are relevant to those features, you cannot expect those features to work. Okay, I, I think you're repeating what I said. Anyway, I, let's move on. It's fine. Yep. I had a comment about routing loops that you made, Chris. So this particular feature, let's say one router. Uh, hey, can you can, say, say who you are? You, you should be in the queue on the on-site tool. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, my name is Shadda. I'm from Juniper. Uh, so I wanted to comment on the routing loop point that you made. So this particular feature, if one router advertises two TLVs for the same uh, link and the other router is not processing those two, then it might be overwriting or it might be ignoring. Then the both of them will not process, will not have the same set of links. So it can cause routing loops. I yep. just wanted to make that comment. You're right. Um, Tony P is currently trying to get on the, the mic, but he's unable to. So um, is there anybody else? In the, oh, Wimo, I, I didn't see you still in the queue. Go ahead. You, you can go ahead if you'd like. I, I mean, unless you're just going to repeat what you said on the list. Yeah.
I'm going to shut the queue down after this, though. Yeah, I think uh, I repeat uh, my solution. I think it's backward compatible as a definition of uh, Chris Ops. And uh, uh, this is why I'm from Future. Uh, I would like to repeat that my solution, or another solution, in the, uh, the solution in another draft is backward or compatible. And I, I also repeat those one in the mailing list. And then if you don't agree, I'll answer again. OK, thanks. Tony, I guess I, I'm going to lock the queue, but you're in it, I guess. So go okay, ahead. very short. Uh, so Chris, I don't know where the mic works. Tony P. Juniper. Uh, so what you said, Chris, I completely disagree. Um, backwards compatible means that I can flip the stuff on the official network and the stuff, the network will stay up and I can flip it route by router, okay? Because de facto today we already have all these wild implementation. If we start to introduce a new TLDs and flip both, you know, just one router, other routers don't understand, um, yeah, that may cause problems, but so, so will the other solution. Okay, because if you introduce completely new information, people don't parse it. Yeah, you end up with routing loops. Um, what Wyman tries to do is basically, and Tony Lee hates me for always saying that, you have to forklift the protocol. Okay, because what will I do? Now I'll advertise the new information format and all information format until I migrate over. No. Yeah, well, that's so, not how, that's not how so once this thing starts to talk this new format that Wyman is suggesting, it's not ISIS. It's just talk something nobody else in the network understands. Yes, it will be loop-free because this router will be completely taken out. If that's what you consider loop-free backwards compatibility, yeah, then operationally speaking for real customers, it's, it's worthless. I, okay, every new feature we've ever deployed could like fail under this like this like thing you're saying like oh well okay if i only if i only deploy the new feature on one router none of the rest of my network will understand yeah. of course they won't you have to deploy it on all your routers no this you don't this i can flip on a single I, router this one the, this one is a mess but we're going to go with it yeah as 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 someone speaking as working group chair as someone who comes from the land of bountiful tlvs uh <laughs> We've, we've, we've discussed this now for almost two years. I think we're going to go with this. We're going to, we're going to do an adoption call and, and hopefully we'll adopt it given all the people that have been involved in draft. And that doesn't mean we, we can talk about uh, single TLB solutions that uh, have back, um, backward compatibility uh, transition as well, but we're not, it's not going to preclude us from doing this. That's that's what I'm saying. Okay, let's move on to the next presentation. And that cue. We have so much discussion, so I will go over the bit model quick. How far are we behind? Coming. Coming. I cannot find my agenda, so I need. You see this? Yeah, this one. fix right. No, no, the LED. Yeah, yeah, this one. So um, I'm going to talk about the YAN data model for ISIS PIX. Next slide, please. So PIX stands for Protocol Implementation Conformance Statements. It's actually an official term in ISO 10, what's the number, 589. So basically, it's a form on a piece of paper. It's a checklist for an implementation to claim what kind of ISS features they support or implement it. And so now we are in 2023. Instead of a piece of paper, we can use YAM data model to implement the same functionality. Um, when we design this model, what do we need to think about? We need to think, uh, <coughs> As we continue to build and uh, optimize ISIS protocol, we have to make sure that this model can be easily extended and will also um, grow. And also the query of ISIS picks should be independent on a, uh, like whether your ISIS process is running on a router or not. So in the current version of the draft, we have three modules, and we will go over them one by one in details. Next, please. 
So the first one is uh, IANA ISS peak stock young. And this one, um, this draft will request IANA to create, uh, we, we, can, we can call it the ISS peaks registry. And the, this module is built based on the, to reflect that registry. And when a new identity is added, uh, uh, when a new entry is added to that registry, a new identity will be added to this module by IANA. And we currently have only two identity defined. The ISS peak is the base one. Uh, that serves as the foundation of this whole module. And we currently only have one RFC level of identity. We call it uh, ISS peaks, SRM PRS. It's based on RFC 8667. That one, we chose to use that RFC as an example here. Next slide. And the centerpiece of this draft is actually a very simple one. It's this um, uh, ITF ISS peaks. What this module has is um, just a container and inside it, there is a lift leave list called supported ISS peaks. That will list all the identities your implementation support. And I have an, a second container called ISS peaks multi-part TLV. I have it um, this separate container that to be augmented by each individual RFC. So the multi-part TLV can be queried individually. Next slide, please. And this uh, is the RFC level module. We chose uh, 8667 as an example, because this one is about SRM PRS. It's a relatively new one, so hopefully everybody still remember what it's about. And we, <coughs> we, that's why we use it. Um, so this whole container, the whole module can only exist when you have the identity that exists in the list in the uh, ITF ISS peaks module. And you can clearly see we have much more content in this tree structure that's showing here. Um, that's what Les said. You know, you can just say, you cannot just say, I support RFC 8667. That's not enough. You have to have all these details. So next slide, please. Um, so as an example, you know, for the, SR capability sub TLV support. Not only you need to say I support this sub TLV, you also need to figure out whether you support uh, IPv4 SRM PRS or IPv6 SRM PRS. It's a, right now I have it in the draft as a leaf. So that's how the current draft is written. And I also have the uh, multi part TLV part uh, definition here. The, the augmentation here. So what, because um, in this RFC, only this two TLV has the um, multi-part TLV capability, you know, whether you can do multi-part TLV for these two TLVs. And you need to claim whether you have the support. Next slide, please. So what, um, in the future, you need to do if you write an ISS draft, right? So if your draft is to be published as an RFC, you will need to add a new entry in the IANA ISS peaks registry. You know, that will create the RFC level identity. You will also need to write a IS, IANA ISS peaks young module. That's to augment um, the IETF um, that will uh, list all the feature details. And also if you have MPTLV support, you will need to augment that container. So exactly to what level of details a uh, portal need to be, you know, you, how you split those features, it's up to the working group to decide. And also this need to be enforced by the working group to make sure in the future this will keep continue to grow. And on the design of the module, so I had a nice talk with Jeff Hess the other day. So 
So we talk about also for the RX level module, it's possible uh, we use identities, also use identities instead of the uh, checklist, sort of like a leaf you have true or false. And we can also use identities. And we may end up with like a complete light list only in the IETF ISIS module. Um, but I did check with Tony P and he confirmed that we, it's better we also ha have the RFC level query capability. So that means uh, we still need the RFC level module. And, but uh, we may consider more to identities if that's the, what the working group want to do. And So, and we, we want to know whether this is the right way to go. And if that's so, we will need collaborators because for all the ISS RFCs will have a lot of work. Okay, Tony. Um, thanks, Tony P. Juniper. Um, two things. Uh, so I highly encourage, especially operators to get involved into the stuff uh, for the reason that this allows you to take a router and without running guys, I actually understand what you have in your hands. Yeah. That's a selling point. I mean, the protocol doesn't have to be configured, run and deployed. You can actually look at the box and you know what you have. And the operators, the resolution, the quality of this stuff will ultimately drive the quality of the RFPs. And from there comes also my observation that we can't just list features. It has to be collected on the RFCs because the RFPs at least you know today are all written along the RFC line. So it's much easier than to for them to kind of map it back of what it is from an RFC, but then the RFC may be only partially supported, so we need the final resolution. So uh, it's important work, uh, tedious work, and I encourage especially people who want to consume the boxes to get involved and make sure that they get what they actually need. Thanks. Uh, we choose to use data model because it's a uh you, for an operator, you query a router's uh, in implementation status. That's pretty much it. You don't want to do it every day. You probably do it once a year or in, until your next upgrade. <laughs> so. AC Lindum Lavin. As someone who's uh, closer to the end than the beginning, I'm wondering, I think this is all really good information. You know, this would be really good to have, you know, have this information on any. I think we have to be careful on the level of granularity. I looked at the SR MPLS. I think that was maybe a little bit overdone to do every, every bit and everything like that. I'm not going to say, but, you know, I'm wondering, are we actually going to do this for every, every, every RFC? And what about the existing RFCs? It's just going to be a lot of work. And we're only doing it for ISIS. So if ISIS adapts this, at least us as the LSR working group, we should do it for OSPF as well, and OSPF V3. But That's I think- we need collaborators. Yeah, okay, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a lot to take on, but I'm saying it's excellent information. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, I, drive, so. so all I was gonna say is, I, um, I like this. I, at first I was like, well, this is pretty crazy, but it's actually useful. And as far as like too much information, I, you know, I'm thinking about the RFC. It, and, and what you just said, Tony, about RFPs, you know, it might be useful to have a way to say, I support this RFC and I have no deviations, right? You know, like, because then it also sort of is a selling point where, you know, it's like, I, I've, I'm just full featured. I haven't deviated from the RFC, I've done everything. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, but you know, maybe that keeps the size down lower too. Um, anyway, that yeah, was, that was that, my only that, comment. That's sort of like you have a, it, it's like yeah, Yang, like Yang like support, all, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I, can, I, can add that I mean, cause Yang has both, it has features yeah. and deviations, but you know, you never want a deviation, right? So it also, so basically you just say, I support every single definition. Yeah. I would hate for this to be a, a vector for like people to half implement everything, right? Oh, well, I've done the major parts and yeah. Is that, is that falling? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. I think we're a little bit over time, but we're not that, we're not bad. Tony P is next. 
Okay. Um, which is this the the uh, security one? Yep. Uh, I don't know, but we're going to again just basic request. Advertising that. link and node security properties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, I show you what the problem is, what the suggested solution framework is. Okay. It, it, this is not a cooked solution, what we should do. This is a taxonomy so we can talk reasonably about the space of the solution, okay? And then we see what falls out of that. Um, next one. All right, so what's the problem uh, statement? What are we addressing? So uh, we're seeing that the routers are being attacked in a more sophisticated way, right? That they've been going on for a while. Let's go, go to the point we actually um, see breaks in into physical location and all kind of interesting ways uh, that are being tried to compromise uh, routers. And for clients, it becomes paramount that you can detect and decommission these routers really quickly. All right. And what we're also seeing is that the demand for, to compute paths where the traffic goes um, that satisfy security concerns is raising. And you know, it's kind of obvious, you can imagine, you know, where that's coming from, right? Geopolitically and so on and so on. So one possibility to, to figure out, you know, how secure is a part of your network is to introduce a monitoring infrastructure and whatever that is, you know, some models, analytics, uh, whatever. The problem with this kind of stuff is that the transport of such infrastructure and all the, you know, involved complexity is itself basically prone to attacks, sophisticated attacks. So basically the attack vector gets even wider. And um, if you lose the monitoring infra, the semantics are unclear. It's not clear what it means, right? Did the infra get attacked? Is the router down? Is it just a blip? Right? And if you start to take networks down because the connection is down, you can basically get yourself basically down a, a downhill slope. So after chats with different parties, suggestion is to actually start in the IGP database to advertise the security properties of the network. And yeah, it will lead to a lot of further discussion what that means. And why is because there's no additional monitoring infra? It's the fastest thing in the network. And if you compromise the IGP database, right, by some means that you can falsify this information or you actually suppress this information or the IGP doesn't come, it doesn't matter. The moment you broke the IGP and the database, you corrupted the database, you basically, there is nothing you can do to recover. Okay, so that's kind of the axiom of where this stuff is going. So next one. So now, since this is not a forum that normally deals a lot with sophisticated security, we need some mental model. I mean, what is security? Just a word, right? Um, and uh, when you look at the security folks, uh, what I like is to have a model which is most widely used. Not that I'm a big of a security expert, uh, expert, but they use a relatively simple model, how you basically define how secure something is. And you talk about the CIA model. It's basically confidentiality, right? So is the information confidential? So somebody cannot snoop it. Is, do you have integrity? Which means it cannot be corrupted, but also replayed, right? There's subtleties there. And do you have availability? Which is very counterintuitive, right? So actually preventing you from having something means something is insecure, right? And the, DDoS by now being something that a lot of people know, you understand what I'm talking about, right? You can suppress the service. Okay, so we need some kind of language that starts to hold up to further talking about complexity. So let's call this thing security characteristics, okay? And they're not comparable. So if something is confidential, it doesn't mean that it is, it is guarantee integrity. And because something is, says integrity, it doesn't mean that it's more secure than confidentiality. So those are kind of, you no, know, it's a three-dimensional vector space, which is kind of orthogonal. All right. So some technologies offer, of course, a mix and guarantee two or, you know, whatever. And the technology of different strengths. That's, so that's a you know, word I'll be using now. And it's kind of uh, intuitive, right? If you have uh, encryption and you have different key lengths, that there's different strength, right? But a certain SHA is weaker than another SHA. We you know, kind of naturally talk about it. So security characteristics. 
and we have technologies with strengths. Next one, please. So now the security characteristic, let's say uh, uh, confidentiality, right? So you encrypt, right? You, you, you can support different encryption algorithms, right? And these, uh, each, the encryption algorithm itself can have different strength. So if we talk about different encryption algorithms, algorithm one, algorithm two, we can say this is a security property. So the security characteristic confidentiality now has you know, a couple of properties, like I'm running this algorithm and I'm also supporting this thing and that always gives me confidentiality, all right? And these properties have strengths. So now think like that. So characteristic is the CIA, where are you? The property is kind of an algorithm you're running and the strength is what key length do I use, all right? Now the security properties are comparable to each other. Right, so I can compare a SHA-1 to a SHA-2 and the SHA-2 with key 100 to a SHA-2 with the 200 bits key. So you can start to carry vectors of a security characteristic, which are security properties, right? So example here, if I have integrity, I can basically say, okay, I'm running a 50 IPsec and a 10 SHA-2 and a checksum. And the 50, 10, 5, are basically the strength of the property. So you know that the IPsec is much more secure than the SHA-2 or the checksum, all right? And for confidentiality, and you see here becomes interesting, the technology sometimes overlaps. So the IPsec will also give you confidentiality, right? So you also carry the confidentiality vector. And forget the null, basically, you have to be able now to compare those vectors. Two links show you, okay, I have this kind of, security properties and I have six security properties. Which link do you choose? Well, you, you need now to compare those things. So if these vectors are not the same length and they have different elements, you have to kind of normalize them so you have a clear comparison. Okay, um, and something like a key length that we carry, we, we, we call a security property attribute. I know it's kind of, here's a glossary, that's kind of the end, but it needs this language to talk clear of what we're actually trying to do. Okay, next one. Uh, now, why all this fuss, right? Because this framework also allows us to introduce completely new uh, properties without lifting you know, the protocol version of the software, all right? So there is a last missing piece where you have to say what you do with the thing you actually don't have it implemented, right? So here shows up a uh, security property and you go like, mm, okay, I don't really know what it is, right? And it's worse when it's missing. Well, you have the strength. So you, you flood, that's the second bullet point. Something basically says, okay, here's the strength of the property. And the funny thing is it doesn't matter what it's called. It's SHA-2, SHA-5, you don't care. It has a certain strength. It's stronger than the other thing or less strong than the other thing. And you have the attribute value because if it's an encryption algorithm, you need the key length and you compare the attribute value. So you go, okay, this guy runs SHA-1, SHA he's going to run a SHA-1, he has a longer key, he's a better guy, all right? Now the flags are necessary because if you don't know what this SHA-2 thing is, you still want to kind of compare it, right? So if you have the attribute value key length, you actually don't know whether better is worse, uh, uh, higher value is better or worse value, uh, smaller value is be better. If you'd carry, for example, availability, link loss, well, if you lose more, it's a worse thing, right? If you, if you look at the encryption algorithm, a longer key is actually better. So you basically say, that's how you compare. It's smaller better or bigger better, or don't even compare. You cannot compare the attribute. It may mean something which has no relevance in terms of comparison. And if you don't see it advertised, you also have to know, right? If this guy advertises something you don't understand, and another guy doesn't advertise it, is it worse or better, right? So you can say, if this stuff is missing, actually the, you should assume it as the maximum value of the attribute. Um, so that allows you in this framework to basically over time introduce completely new properties and being all these things being comparable on routers on all software version. Next thing, please. We've got to wrap up pretty fast. Yeah, 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 that's, that's about it. So here's the inevitable encoding, which is of course uh, not, not very interesting. 
Uh, we need three opaques for each characteristic. You remember each of the CIA, okay? And within that, we carry based to those vectors. Uh, next one. All right, so now use cases, right? So obviously you can do use that for computation. Like I want my path to do something, like don't use a path that, that it, it is not confidential, whatever. Um, you can discover compromised routers, right? Uh, and here come interesting ideas. So um, you can look for something like availability, right? The guy started to lose adjacency. So all of a sudden, it doesn't have many adjacencies. So like, what does it mean? Availability is going down. Is that something you're concerned about? Does this thing become less secure? Will you decommission it? Is, does it raise an alarm? And AC had also an interesting observation. You can look at degradation of things, right? Where the attack may be very sophisticated. Or maybe you just installed a bad software version that has problems. And that degrades availability. Like, for example, number of flaps over some period of time. And if the thing is flapping, you say, okay, the build is going down. This thing is not secure. I know it sounds counterintuitive. Like, how is it not secure? Yes, it's not secure because it lowers, degrades the quality of your network. At a certain point in time, you cannot provide service. And I think that's it. So the properties themselves are, you know, all the attributes are not defined, right? Um, it's a taxonomy to talk clearly about the problem. Okay, and I encourage discussion and probably we start to, you know, to grow slowly some obvious stuff depending on operator input and how, you know, community reacts to the whole thing. Done. All right, thanks. Yeah, speaking as a co-author, we're, we're obviously pretty um, early in this. It's an experimental uh, draft and uh, be, be some challenges in defining both the uh, public and private IANA space for these uh, tuples. Shraddha, I think you're up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're running a little behind. Okay. Uh, hello, good morning. My name is Shadda from Juniper Networks, and I'll be talking about uh, improved OSPF database exchange procedure. Yeah, so uh, just a recap of the problem. This was presented in uh, last IETF. So when the router re C restarts, it will uh, leave the stale LSAs in other nodes, uh, for example, B and E and, and other nodes, which have full adjacencies to B and E, because before C went down, it had a, uh, full adjacencies with B and E. So when C comes up, B and E may end up using old LSAs from C, and they, are, they might assume that adjacency with C uh, is bidirectional, and then use it for computation and install paths that go through C, wherein C is not yet ready and hasn't, uh, 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 it doesn't have adjacencies full with B and E, so hasn't installed the routes in C, which may lead to traffic drops. Next slide, please. So the solution is, uh, so we're trying to come up with a solution which where we don't really need protocol extensions. So. Uh, the solution is to not bring up adjacency with C until the latest LSA from C has been received and uh, has been updated uh, on the uh, on B and E, which are adjacent to C. So, uh, so the change from previous version is that we in previous version we were trying to use LS request list, but that had problems, which was pointed out in the mailing list, and we updated the solution with this modification, wherein. We call this, we, we built a new LSA list. This is called the stale LSA list. So this is internal to the node. It doesn't get advertised or doesn't get uh, communicated to its neighbors. So when uh, a neighbor, uh, is, when an adjacency comes up and a node receives an LSA from its neighbor, uh, wherein the neighbor is the originator of that LSA and the that LSA, you know, the uh, node that received the LSA from the originator has this higher sequence number and, and thus has a, you know, uh, 
it evaluates it to be the newest LSA. It knows that the originator itself is sending a lower sequence number. So it marks its own database copy as the as a stale LSA. And next slide, please. Okay, so until the uh, stale LSA remains in its database, it doesn't bring up the adjacency with the uh, restarting uh, neighbor. So the modified procedure here, you can see that, you know, initially when C comes up, it sends a DBD with sequence number X, uh, wherein, and uh, E is the uh, neighbor of the restarting router and it is sending a sequence number Y. Here X is less than Y. So Y is, Y sequence, sequence number Y is greater. So E uh, assumes that it is generally as per uh, standard OSPF procedures, it assumes Y as the you know, latest LSA. But here the modified procedure is that it marks that LSA as stale and then adds it to stale LSA list. So until uh, E receives a LSA, which is, has a sequence number higher than Y, it doesn't bring that adjacency, make that adjacency full with C. So if you see the procedure here, then uh, C will send an LSA request for Y and then E will flood uh, uh, the uh, uh, LSA A with sequence number Y. And that makes, because it's C's LSA or it sees the originator of the LSA. So it uh, re-originates the self LSA with Y plus one. When that happens, the uh, E has received the latest LSA and it removes that stale marking and then it brings up the adjacency uh, with C. So this is the modified procedure. Yeah, we request for review and comments and request working group uh, adoption. Any questions? Uh, Leanne. Hi, Shwanda, this is Leanne. Uh, thank you for considering some our, some of our commands on the mailing list. Uh, I think uh, for the new version, replacing the request list with the still list can resolve the bad iOS request event. But uh, except this problem, I think other problems we can, we have discussed before still remain, and. Uh, uh, from the picture, you have shown that uh, there are two new confusing issues. Uh, maybe I will elaborate later. We can discuss it. Thank you. Yeah, please, please send the comments on the list and we can discuss more. Thank you. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks. What is that noise? Is, is that our, us causing the noise? Oops. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do I need to control the slides myself? This is, um, yeah, hang on. I'll get. I'll, I'll send it over to you. Okay. So. okay. Okay, I think it should have a list of presentations mm. you can select from. Okay, I have chosen. Uh, okay, I'll start. Uh, this is Lian from Tenor Mobile. I'm going to talking about uh, the OSPL agency suppression. And uh, at uh, ITF 116 and uh, 117 meeting, we have presented twice and uh, we also discussed it uh, several times by email. This draft uh, is to address the same problem with the previously draft. And uh, for the latest version, there is uh, no much updates, uh, including changing loopback address example to external route example. Uh, this is much more easier to understand uh, this graph. And uh, many thanks to, to David uh, for this comment. Um, there is also some figure and uh, text optimization. Uh, this solution itself is not uh, affected by this optimization. Uh, 
Uh, we all know that uh, there are two different solutions to address the, the same problem currently. And uh, uh, here we call them solution A and uh, solution B for short. Uh, the general idea of solution A is that uh, restarting router notifies its neighbor to surprise advertising agency. Within the suppression time range shown as the right price, the black hole can be avoided. Uh, and for solution B, the general idea is that uh, neighbor router marks uh, LSA as stale and uh, hold the neighbor state machine. Bring agency to full state if the LS request list and the still LSC list are both empty. Um, since uh, the detailed mechanism have been fully elaborated uh, separately, so this time uh, we will focus on the difference uh, between the two solutions. Um, the general comparison as shown as the table, we have also posted them on the mailing list before. Based on the latest version of the solution B, uh, I just died also uh, accept the bad LS request event. I think uh, that none of the other issues on the mailing list have been addressed. So we listed uh, them here again. Um, First, uh, there are two fatal scenarios that cannot be bypassed. Uh, scenario one, uh, for the root delayed uh, scenario, it is okay for solution one, solution A. But uh, for solution B, if some routes uh, does not exist after restarting, the neighbor router uh, cannot uh, detect the route uh, existed before. So I think that uh, the neighbor router has no chance to map the database LSD as still. This will result in the solution not uh, taking effect. And uh, the scenario two for the remote neighbor, uh, solution A is okay because the, the surprise timer can be adjusted according to the network environment and uh, it can uh, guarantee the remote neighbor first to receive the regenerated LSD of the restarter and then the agency LSD of the direct neighbor. But uh, for solution B, because of the sequence of the flooding process cannot be controlled precisely, the order of the LSD receiving cannot be guaranteed for the remote neighbor. So we think that uh, it hides a window for black hole still. And uh, also there are some other aspects uh, taken into consideration. Uh, the first one for the mechanism, uh, restarting router or neighbor router take control. Uh, we think that the former is better since uh, it's an effective way to reduce the scope of the influence. And uh, the second one, um, the mm -hmm. impact on the neighbor state machine. I think uh, uh, the solution B changes the core process of the neighbor state machine. And uh, in case of any failure, the neighbor state will remain unestablished. It's a big risk in neighbor state uh, machine. And uh, the third one, the scope of influence. Uh, um, the solution one is only, only during the unplanned restarting and uh, uh, I think uh, it has no interaction with other filters. Uh, so, but the solution B will go through all the features related to the labor establishment, uh, including GR, NSR, or link failure recovery, etc. So, uh, we think that uh, um, it's also a big risk. Uh, the last one, the maturity. Uh, the mechanism of the solution A is similar to ISIS and uh, it's widely used in the network. Um, in general, uh, we think that uh, uh, effective and uh, less risky solution should be preferred.
and uh, except uh, these uh, problems, uh, there are some other new issues in the main process of the steel list uh, for the latest version. Uh, uh, I will discuss the, it here and uh, please take into consideration. Leon, you've got three people in the queue. Um, do you want to hear the comments or do you want to like maybe wrap the presentation up quicker? Oh, okay. I will try uh, quick. Uh, the last uh, sheet, the last sheet uh, is the main problem in the latest version. Uh, it uh, we have elaborated in the right uh, character. Please refer to it. Okay, I'd like to listen to the comments. Okay, maybe flip through your last two slides so we can see them at least. <laughs> Just quick to see what they were that we're missing. Mm -hmm. What's, uh, yeah, what slides? Nice. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, AC, you're up first. Yeah, AC, Linda, I don't, I don't, I don't understand uh, the route delete scenario that you're talking about because if you're um, if the restarting when the restarting uh, router goes down, the neighbor relationship will will be terminated when you start before you start the new database exchange. So I don't think there can be stale routes. I mean, if that were broken in OSPF, we would have heard about it a long time ago. So there isn't. I think some of the uh, some of the comparisons, you know, are are right. But that first, I don't understand that first scenario and I don't think there's any other issues either. I, I, I just saw either of those. I don't really think maybe we, in interest of time we probably should talk about this on the list, but I don't think those two are problems. Uh, okay, can, can I elaborate it, uh, the scenario one here? Or we discuss it on the mailing list? Maybe let's go on the mailing list or let's get the other questions. Okay, in. okay, no problem. Go ahead, Les. Okay, I'm, I'm going to repeat what I said at the last meeting, and I hope both sets of authors will, will listen to me this time. <laughs> um, I really think the two drafts should be merged. The first draft has the advantage that it only requires local changes. There's no interoperability issues, and that's certainly of benefit. But the second uh, draft uh, is more robust because it allows for the starting router to determine when it's ready to actually start forwarding, which the first draft does not solve. So I really encourage both sets of authors to collaborate and come up with a combined solution. Thanks. Yeah, we always like that merging and collaboration. Uh, okay, last, uh, Ketan. Ketan Talaulikar, Cisco. Uh, I think Les mentioned it, but I will say that in this comparison table, the fact that uh, one uh, is uh, strictly local behavior and has no interop, and can be just done by one router, uh, has a significant advantage and simplicity in uh, rolling out. Okay, I locked the queue. I'm sorry about that. We're, we got to move on. Yeah, uh, so uh, just now, uh, th this is Wichan from China Mobile. I'm also the uh, operand A draft as a uh, uh, co-author. Uh, I think we can consider the merge. Maybe, maybe uh, after the meeting offline, we can uh, have some discussion. Yeah. Do you do? Do you know Shrada? Like you just saw yeah, her come up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you guys get together and talk. Right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. Next presentation. Who? You're on my outline now. Okay, I will continue. Is the second topic advertising unreachable? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I need to like I think pass you the buck again. Hang on. Yeah. Well, that's weird. Maybe not. Can you close yours? Oh, I can close. Okay. And then, yeah, does it, do you have a selection again? 
No, I haven't seen it. It says AC. I'll take that off. Yeah. That was... take, take that one off. The green one. Jataka is being shared. Okay, I got it. Hang on. Rogue presenter. Okay, I see it. Uh, hi everyone, I will continue with the second draft advertising unreachable link in OSPF. Uh, the draft proposed an effective way to advertise unreachable links link in OSPF and uh, it has been presented at uh, interim meeting 2022 and ITL 115 meeting. And uh, thank Issei for his valuable comments and we are glad inviting him joining in this draft. Uh, we have uploaded uh, the latest version, including three major updates. The first one, uh, through the comparison from all aspects, we think uh, the solution based on the maximum link metric is better. So we focused further on this solution and uh, delayed the other solution from the draft. Uh, the reason we will illustrate it uh, in the following page. And uh, the second one, we add a new section, management considerations for the scenario of low speed and uh, high speed uh, link mix. And uh, the third update, we have optimized uh, some text in the draft, uh, including some grammar and the vocabulary uh, correction. Uh, the old version proposed the two solutions, solution one, uh, which is retained in the new version using the max link metric that already exists to, to advertise the unreachable links. And uh, the solution B, uh, using a new flag to advertise the unreachability. And, uh, Uh, we chose the solution A for several considerations uh, Considerations for the first one for OSPL prefixes. The maximum metric is already defined and uh, infinity. And uh, the second uh, solution B requires uh, the advertising and uh, accessing of OSPL V2 extended link theory for OSPF, SPF calculation, but solution A does not, so it's much more simple. And uh, uh, the third one is SIS defines the maximum link metric and as infinity uh, through the RC file three O file. And uh, the last uh, implementation of solution A would be cleaner. Uh, for the backup compatibility to avoid uh, routine loops caused by the inconsistent uh, treatment to the max link metric, uh, a new bit in router functional, functional capability theory should be defined. Uh, this is compliant with the RFC 7770 and uh, uh, the new bit uh, is uh, Apply capable for router LC, the OSPL V2 extended link TLV and the uh, router link TLV of OSPL V3. And uh, uh, all routers supporting the max link metric feature must uh, advertise uh, this capability. If for uh, uh, detecting the presence of a reachable router LC, uh, but uh, without the ambiguous sighting, uh, all routers must uh, recalculate routes without uh, considering max link metric. Um, 
We add a new section for the management consideration in the latest version. Uh, for some networks, the operator may still want links with maximum metric to be treated as reachable. Uh, for example, the auto costing of links is used, and there is a mix of low and high speed links. So, in such cases, uh, the updated routers can disable that capability and still treat links with maximum metric as reachable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, support of the uh, max link metric capability should be configurable. And uh, we also recommended that uh, implement, it, implementations uh, supporting this draft and the uh, auto costing limited uh, the maximum cost uh, to ma max link metric minus one. And uh, uh, we have discussed uh, the uh, adoption before, so here we'd like to ask for WG adoption and any questions and comments are welcome. Thank you. Ketan uh, Talaulikar, Cisco. So amongst the options, the option A, uh, which doesn't have a separate encoding, uh, might be simpler and easier especially because we are introducing a capability uh, that requires this to be done uh, area-wide. Yes, we need a capability to prevent the, Anyways. you know, the routing loops, no matter which correct. solution we correct. Yes. So, so option one is simpler. Uh, that's one. Uh, second is that uh, we have this, uh, you know, unreachable and we have uh, not to use as a transit. Uh, so we may be so so basically max metric minus one means uh, there is a stub router uh, RFC in OSPF which basically says that uh, you consider uh, the max metric link as you know still up and uh, usable but not for transit traffic but you can still reach the router using it. We may want to factor that in uh, as part of this work. Yeah, we, 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 we do need to discuss that no matter which yeah. solution we pick. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Actually, yeah. actually, actually, the flag, you wouldn't, you have two separate, you have two things you have to check, yeah. but yes. Yeah, and the third and the last point is that uh, while we do this for the OSPF metric, we should probably also look at uh, the same for the TE metric. Doing the similar thing for the TE metric, which is advertised and flooded uh, by OSPF. We can discuss offline right. on the list. We're almost out of time on this slot. So, Wang, do you want to go? Okay. So, okay. so Peyton, please send your last question to the email list. We can discuss this further. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think I don't think there's uh, any compatibility problem with Stublink because of the Stublink, uh, but we'll look at that definitely. Sh shall I share the slide? Okay, I have stopped it. Oh, was Wayne presenting this? Is that why he was in the queue? Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I was confused about why you were in the queue. Can you hear me? Yeah, hang on one second. I'll pass through the slides. Okay. I thought you were asking a question. <laughs> okay, you should be able to select your slides. Oh, wait to find my slides. So, hello everyone. I'm Yifan from the Huawei Technologies. Today, my topic is the IGP flexible algorithm with link class. My slides will be divided into four parts. First is the background and motivations. And second, I will introduce the path computation method based on link class. And third is the extended uh, subtail views of ECS and OSPF. And the last is the future plan. 
So first is the motivation and problem statement. As we all know that the link loss is one of the most important performance metrics that directly impacts the quality of service. It is necessary to avoid passing through links with a high packet loss rate during forwarding. So to achieve this goal by using flexi flexible algorithm, there are two problems. First is how we can identify the link with a high, uh, high packet loss. And second is how to use the flexible algorithm to do the pa pass computation. Unfortunately, the first one is, is solved. The link loss is advertised by the unidirectional link loss subtail we defined in RFC 8570 for ECS, and also it's, it's advertised in OSPF, which describes the loss as a packet percentage between two directly connected neighbors. But uh, now the flexible algorithm currently cannot support path computation based on link loss. Since link loss cannot be described as general addable metrics like IGP cost, by that I mean the general IGP cost can be added to one, from one to another. And uh, for example, the A to C cost can be described as A to B minus, uh, plus B to C. However, the, the metrics like the uh, link loss cannot be described as that. So new FAD constraints can be defined to exclude links that do not meet the link loss requirements during pass ca ca calculation. So, uh, so, uh, so we we propose the IGP flexible algorithm pass computation based on link loss. The basic idea is these two are, are twofold. First, the link loss is used as a link constraint for pass computation. That is the link the links whose loss rate exceeds the sp a specif specified value are excluded. And second, the metric, path, metric type just remains unchanged. We can we still use the IGP cost, T cost, or delay to do the pass computation. Our goal is to prove links with a high packet loss rate during pass computation. Uh, for example, in the figure below, uh, from we need to find a uh, shortest path from uh, node one to node four. Uh, in the beginning, the path is chosen as the link one to four since it has the uh, it has the minimal cost. However, the loss of it is is extremely large, so the we will obtain a bad uh, cut of service. So, but uh, uh, with the ex exclude max link loss constraint imported, and now the one to four and the two to four links are excluded. So now the best pass comes to be one, two, three, two, four. So now we can get a, 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 a good pass with, uh, with a small loss. So, and then it's the exclude maximum link loss subtail V, which is advertised in OSPF and ECs both. Uh, it is proposed to specify the upper limit of the link loss. It is defined as a sub TLV of the FAD TLV. Uh, the, link the maximum link loss advertised in this TLV must be compared with the link loss advertised in the unidirectional link loss sub TLV. If the actual link loss is larger, the link must be excluded from the link flex, flex algorithm topology. So, uh, and uh, uh, now, the TLV is shown below. Now we use the type 252, which is the inner realization. And in the future, it can be not, it can be modified. Uh, and the length of it is three octets. Uh, just uh, the, max, the maximum link class is just defined as it was defined in the unidirectional link class sub TLV, which is a, a 24-bit field carries link packet loss as a percentage of the total traffic sent over a configurable interval, and the maximum value is 50%. So uh, it is, uh, so the, uh, some future plans, we can, we can consider some common operators or constraints to support dif different kinds of metric inflexible algorithm path computation, such as we can consider the fractions or Gauss functions to be the operator and to, to combine them to a merge cost. So that's all. Really, thanks. Uh, thanks. Okay. Um, Gao. Okay. This is Fang Gao from the Zhongguan Chinese Laboratory. I, it's hard to hear you. What? 
It's hard to hear. Like, can you? Is, is that on? Is it a fine? It, okay. It doesn't it's sound fine. like it's working well. It's not, yeah, it doesn't sound like it's on. I don't know. Maybe okay. come up here. Oh. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, as the mm, link loss value of uh, actual link in the network may be flapping around or over the maximum limitation of the of the link loss value set by the network operator, that depends on the fiber quality. So, if we uh, and it's a significant uh, difference between the link loss and the IGP link cost. So if we take the um, link loss as a metric to calculate the logic typology of an algorithm, uh, I think it's necessary to um, avoid or suppress the situation of link switch over and the switch back, which is triggered by the um, link loss so my question is that in your design, is there some mechanism to avoid this situation triggered by the flapping? Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, Gao, did you have any answer to that or do you wanna just move on? That might maybe go to the back one. It actually works a lot better. Uh, Christoph Sharkovich, Juniper Networks. Uh, I have a question to the link loss. So one of the causes for the packet loss actually could be QS. So I could, for example, have best of all class limited to the 10% of the link capacity and send, I don't know, 20% of the link capacity as, as the best of, and of course you have a lot of loss in the best of all class. At the same time, you can, uh, you know, link is not utilized, overutilized, you can send um, high cl <coughs> higher classes like voice or video. So did you consider uh, this in your design, uh, this, this QS aspects of the packet loss? <laughs> Thank you. That, that the, the, you would, typically have, uh, that's independent of the IGP unless you had separate topologies for it. So it's not part of the base base uh, flex algorithm. I mean, you'd need a separate topology for yeah, different yeah, classes I mean, of service. Yes, but I mean, packet loss could be caused by QS. Yes, not only link. Uh, oh, oh you're, saying, you're saying you want no, uh, just, packet just, loss per class of traffic. I, I, I'm just questioning if it's considered QS because the packet it, loss it, can be not only caused by the bad quality it, of the link, but by the QS as well, yes. Oh, right. Oh, yes, yes. I see you're seeing. Yeah, we're going to have to move on. This, this is really, I mean, this seemed useful to me, and I think we, we need more discussion on the, yep. on the list. Yep. Thank you. Sa Sasha, do you have a quick comment? That's Julius. Yeah, Sasha's in front of oh, Julius. Sasha, okay. And then um, yeah, you, you're locked out. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so basically, there are two kinds of link loss. There's physical layer link loss, say, on the radio link, and link and uh, packet loss due to congestion. And those are very different. Now, if you're considering here, it wasn't clear to me which of the two kinds of loss is the one you're trying to work uh, against. Uh, if you're working with physical layer link loss, then most uh, lossy link layers perform ARQ at the link layer. So you have two different losses. You have the physical layer link loss, which is very high, and the one you see at the network layer, which is much lower. And by the time you see loss at the network layer, it's too late. You really I, want, yeah? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, but in the, TA, in the TE link metrics, I mean the TE uh, traffic engineering metrics that we have today, we only have a single number. Yes. I mean, I mean, so picking on I just, that. I mean, picking on this, just this draft with all the different types of link loss, it's something that's a, it's a bigger problem. I agree. I agree. I'm just mentioning that that is something that should be kept in mind when you're working with link loss. Now, if you're working with link, oh. with packet loss due to congestion, 
uh, then uh, working at this layer is okay. It might be better to have hooks into your AQM so you have early warning of packet loss, but working with at this point is good. But you run in a different problem is that you're generating a positive feedback loop, uh, a negative, sorry, feedback loop, and you risk running into oscillations, which can be worked around, but again, it's something that has to be kept in mind. Okay, thanks, Sasha. Do, can you go quick? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think I uh, maybe this has been. I just hope this is. I, I'm Sasha Weinstein. I just hope you can hear me uh, because uh, unfortunately uh, the voice quality. Uh, at the mic uh, in we, the room. We can hear you. Can you go quick? Okay, fine. My question, uh, I think that there is a problem with this proposal because if the link due to packet loss is excluded from traffic, uh, it may well be that packet loss will decrease or even disappear. In the best case, in the worst case, if you remove all the traffic from the link, uh, there will be no traffic and there uh, no packets will be sent and as a consequence, no packets uh, would be lost, which means that the link would return back to will return back to carrying traffic and uh, that's it. So I think that excluding the link based on the percentage of uh, lost packets uh, may be somewhat problematic. You need some traffic that is something that is always there, something that cannot be, will not, definitely will not be removed so that you can uh, understand whether packet loss uh, is or isn't high. You cannot just rely on traffic for measuring packet loss, normal traffic, uh, and then exclude pa a packet from, uh, from, from the network, from, uh, carrying traffic based on that. Okay, Sasha, thanks. It seems like there's a lot of uh, a lot of points about like loss and measurement. And we can it's take racist. that. Yeah, we can yeah. take that to the list. Thank you. Um, okay, Wayne, we're going to move to the next presentation. Okay, okay. We we hope to get comments from the mailing list, and we, I will ask. I will give the answers. Thanks. Thank you, Ren. Is it Ran or Ryan? Yeah, Ryan. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me get your slides up. I do run, run. No, Jesus. In Chinese, we call it Ryan. <laughs> it, I just remember there was a movie, <laughs> Ryan. But, yeah. Okay, I'm still looking for the slides. Oh, we're bringing up the slides. I want to say that we do need something here, so we do need this protocol. Um, extension. Is this prefix slide extension? Yes. For OSPF and OSPF UK. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ryan from LTE. Uh, today, I would like to talk about the prefix flag thesis for OSPF V2 and OSPF V3. On behalf of all the co-authors, ne next, please. Yes, this is uh, for the motor VCs. <coughs> Each prefix is advertised along with uh, eight bit field of capabilities by using the prefix opinion, uh, options, which is defined 5340, and the flag field in the OSPF V2 extended prefix TLV, which is defined up C7684. However, for OSPF V3, all the bits of the prefix options have already been assigned, and for OSPF V2, there are not many undefined is left in the OSPF V2 extended prefix TLV. This document solves the problem of insufficient existing flags and defines the prefix attribute sub TLVs for OSPF V2 and OSPF V3, respective for the extended flag fields. Next, right? This is for the background for SPF V2 as defined in RFC uh, 7684. The length of the flag field is eight bits, and there are only uh, two, two bits left in OSPF V2 extended uh, prefix TLV that are undefined. 
Uh, next, please. Uh, for SPF V3, the list of the flag field is also eight bits, and all the bits have already been uh, defined as so uh, in below. Next, please. Yes, uh, this document creates uh, two new variable length prefix attribute sub TLV for OSPF V2 and OSPF V3. Uh, this is the format of OSPF V2 prefix attribute sub TLV. Uh, the type is 2BD and the list indicates the list of the uh, value par part in bytes. And for uh, prefix attribute, uh, it uh, contains an array of units of uh, 30 two bit flags numbered from the most uh, significant as uh, bit zero. Uh, 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 correct, uh, sorry, I uh, didn't notice the, the, uh, uh, the latest version of, uh, uh, the latest version update of the draft uh, LSR, uh, uh, LSR, uh, uh, prefix uh, announced. Uh, so uh, there is, uh, <coughs> So this uh, correctly, uh, two new bits um, have, have been defined, uh, U flag and the UP flag. Uh, OSPF V2 prefix attribute sub TLV is a sub TLV of the OSPF V2 uh, extended prefix TLV as defined in RFC uh, 7684. Next, please. Uh, this is the, the format of, of OSPF V3 prefix attribute. Uh, this, the type is also needed to, to be D, to be defined, and uh, the prefix uh, uh, attribute uh, is the same as uh, the OSPF V2 prefix attribute sub TLV. Uh, and it also correctly to new bits, U flag and UP flag are defined, as defined in draft IDP array's prefix announced. And the prefix attribute sub TLV is a sub TLV of the following OSPF V3 TLV as defined in RFC. 8362, an uh, inter area prefix TLV, inter area prefix TLV, and external prefix TLV. Next, please. Um, the extended flag field is an array of units of uh, 32 flags that are allocated uh, starting from the most significant bit. And this document uh, uh, doesn't define any flag. Uh, the bits of the extended flag will be defined by uh, future uh, comments and uh, uh, PCEP peers must hide the very uh, uh, list of the prefix attribute sub TLV. If a device receives uh, the prefix attribute sub TLVs of a list more than it is currently supported or understand it, uh, it must ignore the bits beyond that list. Uh, if the uh, device receives the prefix attribute sub TLV of a list, less than the one supported by the implementation, it must act as if the bits beyond the list uh, were not set. Next, please. This is the backward compatibility. Uh, our implementation that uh, doesn't understand or support the prefix attribute sub TLV must ignore the TLV and further, any additional bits in the OSPF V2 and OSPF V3 prefix attributes sub TLV that are not uh, understood by our uh, implementation must be ignored. Next, please. This is the update. Uh, in the first uh, version of draft iOS and cast the flag defines a new variable length prefix attribute sub TLV uh, for SPF add a new flag in the prefix attribute sub TLV to advertise uh, the any cost property. However, due to the receive, uh, receive some comments from the working group and uh, in the third version, uh, the existing uh, TLV is still used for the uh, extension for any cost. But a new draft, uh, for this draft, draft the two RSR prefix attended flags were separated from this draft. Uh, that draft and to solve the problem of insufficient existing flags. Next, please. Yes, comments welcome, and uh, uh, we do request the uh, working group to call for adoption. Thank you. Peter, use the back mic. Hi, Peter from Cisco. So 
Just a question to the working group, basically. Uh, do we want to backport the existing flags to this? So in the future, we can look at the one place. I know it may be more complicated than this because we still need to send them in the old ones, but just an idea. I don't know. OK. AC Lindem, uh, I'm up next in the queue anyway, too. Uh, I don't know if it's helpful because they're, they're fixed formatted in, in many cases, or at least in some cases, they're fixed formatted. So then you have the, the question of conflicting information, capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know that it's worth it. The one, the one comment I had is the slide confused me because you said that you weren't, you were, you were allocating bits for, uh, OSPF v3, but not for, for, for v2. Yeah. But, but the unreachable draft the, uh, allocates them for both protocols. That, that one thing, uh, go back. Yeah, you see, yeah, currently no bits defined. Yeah. I think that's wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, next up. Uh, Meng Zhao, are you present or remote? Oh, you're remote. Okay, let me pass you the slides. Hello, everyone. This is Meng Xiao from UH3C Technologies. Uh, this presentation is about IGP color well routing. It may also be referred to as IGP car. Uh, there are some IGP based networks in which only the P nodes run BGP, while the other nodes run only IGP. Uh, existing works such as BGP car and BGP CT focus on BGP based. Uh, Intent aware solutions. Uh, when enabling intent aware routing in the example network, they require the ABR nodes to run BGP and signal BGP routes for intent aware passes. However, some network operators may want to keep their routing protocol deployments unchanged. I, I just want to point out so other people aren't confused. Those routers that are uh, ABRs, they're really ASBRs between different IGP domains. I think that'll make it clearer for the rest of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, this draft proposes an IGP-based solution without requiring the ABR or SBR nodes to run BGP. Uh, the overall uh, mechanism of IGP color well routing is similar with the BGP-based solution. There are two types of routes, service route and a car route. The BGP service route is colored with C1 using extended community, which is same with BGP-based solution. Uh, the difference is that car route is dis distributed by uh, IGP rather than BGP. Uh, E2C1 is an IGP car route in underlay that provides intent aware path to E2. Uh, it is originally advertised by E2 and then redistributed by ABR nodes across different IGP domains. Uh, BGP service route is resolved over IGP car route and automatically uh, stilled onto a color aware path. Uh, it can steal for L3 VPN, EVPN, global table, and so on. Uh, this slide is about uh, SR policy based IGP car. Uh, in this case, SR policy provides intent in each domain. Uh, E2 advertises an IGP car route in domain 3 for prefix E2 uh, with color C1 and the label uh, 168002. Uh, ABR231 resolves the uh, car label uh, over SR policy. Uh, 
and uh, redistributes the car route into domain two. Uh, then ABR121 do the similar uh, process. Uh, finally, the car route is received by E1 and the BGP service route is resolved over it. Uh, when E1 forwards the VPN packet, it pushes uh, segments in SR policy one, the car label and the VPN label into the MPRS label stack. Uh, when it reaches uh, ABR121, the car label is on the top. Uh, then ABR121 pushes the uh, segments in SR policy two into the label stack and ABR231 will do the similar things and steal the packet into SR policy three in domain three. Uh, this slide is about Flex Ergo based IGB car. Uh, in this example, uh, Flex Ergo 128 is running in each domain and mapped to color C1. Uh, on the control plane, the main difference with the previous SR policy case is that uh, on each ABR, the car label is resolved over Flex Ergo of that domain using the prefix seed of the advertiser of the car route. Uh, on data plane, the packet is forwarded along the path computed by flex ergo 128, and the top label is the uh, prefix seed of the border device. Uh, this is a hybrid case. Uh, in domain 1 and uh, 3, the, the intent of card C1 is provided by SR policy, uh, while in domain 2, uh, color C1 is mapped to flex ergo 128. Uh, the, me the mechanism is similar with previous slides, so let me skip these details. Uh, the advertisement of car route in IGP is to attach a new defined car sub TRV to a prefix. The car sub TRV carries the color value and the encapsulation information in sub sub TRV. Uh, the encapsulation can be MPRS label index or SRV6 seed. Uh, a prefix TRV can carry multiple car sub TRVs for different intents. IGP shortcut can be used to steal IP traffic into SR policy, uh, but if there are multiple SR policies to the same endpoint, the traffic will be load balanced, which is not desired in IGP car. Uh, so IGP shortcut me mechanism is enhanced to be color aware. Uh, the key point is to choose the SR policy with the same color as the next hop for each pair of E and C. And then the forwarding entry for IGP car route will be installed. Uh, the in label, uh, label is the car label. Uh, the out label is the segments in SR policy uh, plus the car label. Uh, when resolving over Flex ergo, the first step is to determine the algorithm based on the mapping relationship between color and algorithm, and then find the car route advertiser's prefix seed associated with that er flex ergo and add it into uh, encapsulation. Uh, it should be noted that uh, whether resolving over SR policy or uh, flex ergo, uh, the IGP car route is only processed on the border devices. IGP car function should be disabled on intermediate nodes. Uh, car, car database is a logical uh, collection of resolved car routes. It is used for IGP redistribution and uh, BGP next hop resolution. Uh, here are the comparisons with BGP-based solution. Uh, the advantage is that the IGP card does not require the ABR nodes to run BGP. Uh, when enabling intent and well routing in IGP-only networks, there is no need to change existing deployments. Uh, 
uh, uh, one dis disadvantage is that uh, card routes are flooded to all IGP nodes, uh, although they are opaque to intermediate nodes and uh, only processed by ABR nodes, and uh, uh, summarization of uh, car routes might help. Uh, IGP car is suitable for not very large networks. Another disadvantage is that uh, color assignments in different domains must be unified. Uh, uh, next step, we uh, will add uh, more details about SRV6 data plane and uh, the summarization of uh, car route. Uh, any questions or comments are welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, okay. So uh, this is as a working group member. Uh, AC mentioned that ABR is wrong here, but it makes me just wonder about the whole concept that we, when you have your slides showing domain, domain, domain with ABRs between, do you, do you actually, are you saying that like operators are, are running three different IGP domains exactly. with no BGP or are you misunderstanding and that they're running three areas with ABRs? Yeah, no, I, uh, well, that's what makes sense. <laughs> but like I'm saying, is he confused about that, right? Like, are those domains or areas? ABRs, uh, they would be areas. Uh, no, no, uh, the, the domains uh, run a different uh, IGP instance. Uh, so area uh, border it, router doesn't make any sense there, right? Uh, it should be a ASBR. Uh. Okay, and so I, I want to know how hypothetical the situation is that you're saying some, some providers, I mean, you don't even say nobody runs BGP. Everybody runs BGP, but then you're saying only P between PEs and that some, some operators run without BGP connecting these domains. Is that, is that an idea that you have? Or, or is, I mean, is that really like happening right now? Uh, uh, in the example network here, uh, the ASBR uh, nodes uh, of different uh, IGP domains, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they are uh, one device uh, running two IGP instances, and uh, uh, the, the IGP routes from uh, one, one instance uh, will be redistributed to another instance. Uh, there are some networks uh, that say they don't run BGP inside, they just uh, run on the uh, P nodes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, um, Dave, what, when we get Dave, oh, you go ahead. Is it Elmar? Uh, does this work? Yeah. Just it one doesn't minute. work well. We don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, this needs more discussion of, the, of both the use case and whether these, how much of the overlay routes are being put into the IGP underlays. I didn't get that just from the draft. Of course, I read it very quickly, but I didn't, I couldn't really visualize how much of the overlay was being put into the underlay, yeah. which isn't a good idea. I know it says not very large networks, but I don't know what. Just, uh, just another thing on this ABR, ASBR. Uh, if this is truly an ASBR, you should put two ASBRs in that picture because you know you can't just say this is uh, an ABR because then yes, it's one node. But if it's an ASBR, normally each domain has its own ASBR. And then this whole thing doesn't work anymore because they don't run an IGP between those two ASBRs. Or if you have one node with two instances, you're also unlikely to have a loop that runs an IGP between those instances. So this is highly confusing. So either you have a picture showing one, AS, one ABR or two ASBRs. 
but having one ABR that's actually an ASPR is not helping, I think, the clarity of this uh, uh, discussion. I can't, I can't say for today, but uh, 15, 20 years ago, people did do mutual redistribution between IGP instances and, and use tags, yeah. Yeah, but uh, that would be two. Even if it, I, I, yeah, even if it's one router doing it, there's two instances. Yeah, that that should be visualized. Uh, Ijen, you're up. We're on, we're up, we're almost out. We're out of time now, so I'm gonna try to get you you and John. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, his opinion that uh, no. if we use uh, SBR, there should be two SBR in the different domain. So uh, for this uh, proposal, I think the uh, the a uh, different area may be more appreciated. Yeah, not different domain. Okay, J John. Um, John Scudder. Uh, I just wanted to echo something that Tony Lee said in the chat, which was to the extent that this is um, trying to uh, align with something that's being worked on an IDR. Um, the IDR work is not at all done or resolved as far as I can tell. And so, I mean, it's fine to be discussing this as an individual contribution right now here, but if this were going to be adopted as um, working group work, I think we would need to have a serious conversation about whether it's premature. Okay, thank you. That's a great uh, sort of liaison. <laughs> Uh, between so yeah we should definitely wait if, if, if for the main work to be worked out there I guess uh, okay that's it uh, sorry David we don't have time for your presentation we're done it's 1131 yeah it's 1131 so everybody take uh, I know David after the last IETF David sent out an email on this draft I'd like people to read it especially people that are more familiar with the uh, DHCP deployment the v V6 deployment with prefix delegation and, and look and see if this is a reasonable thing to do. And one more thing before everyone leaves. For presenters, when you request a time, please add two minutes to your request when you won't be talking so that we have time for comments because those are that's the main like value here. Thank you. Thanks. One of the values. Hi. How's it going, sir? How are we doing, man? How are you doing? Well, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're trying to we're trying to improve. I may have fixed my like weight issue again. I did this yeah, two years ago and fixed it. One, one thing I've always wondered and is I think I might have figured out what I did last time. It. So I just did it, but it just started a week ago, so there's no no chance for results. Um, actually, I should put my mask on okay, okay. because yeah, I also yeah. have a bug. Uh, yeah. It's not COVID. There was one more uh, comment I had on it. I'll, I'll yeah, send it to you, though. It's easier if I send it. Yeah. Good to okay. see you. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. How are you doing? Like, what are you working on? Okay. I'm an artist, so working on different things yeah photo wise do a lot of you doing like you still doing protocols or? i'm still doing protocols yeah okay. have the 